Well, this morning we looked at having the right focus. And this evening we're going to look at if you have the right focus, how does that affect the way you live? Um, we're going to be looking particularly at verse 8 in Acts chapter 1. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. How does having the right focus um, affect you? Well, it, it should affect you. And it has a, a number of effects. The, the first effect that we can see here in verse 8, if you have the right focus, is that you will be changed. There will be a change in you. And this change has been brought about by God, the Holy Spirit. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, up, come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. There is a, a, a change in your life and in your lips. Uh, the verses that came directly before that are verses where the, uh, the, the disciples are asking Jesus, they're saying, uh, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? When will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus answers and says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. You see, there are, there are people that uh, appear to be believers and are believers, but their focus is wrong. Their focus is on knowing things and focusing on certain peripheral issues. Things that, that are good and right in their own place, but not in the central place. Because Jesus replies and says, it is not for you to know these things. That's not to do with you. But what is to do with you is the Holy Spirit coming into your lives, changing you and making you my witnesses. So, so believers are not necessarily to be the ones that sit down and think and talk and discuss and debate, though they may do that. But Christians are to be ones whose lives are changed and who go out. Now, there was a, a, a young man who was converted, a man called William Wilberforce, who we all know was used by God to get rid of slavery in Britain. And when he was converted, he wasn't sure what he should do. He, he thought to himself, well, maybe I should leave politics, because he was a young politician of about 24. Maybe I should leave politics and I, I should go into the ministry. Or maybe I should join a, a group or something. Maybe I should, I should spend my time in prayer and, and reading the scriptures. And so he spoke to his friend, William Pitt, the, the prime minister. And Pitt said to him, Pitt, who had a Christian background, his father was a Christian and brought him up with Bible stories, he was quite wise, even though he wasn't a believer himself. He said, from what I know about Christianity, Christianity isn't merely to lead to introspection and to looking in. Christian uh, life and Christianity is to lead to a change in life and to action. So, Wilbur, I suggest to you that you don't leave your place in the House of Commons. You stay there and you look at what you can do for God. That was his advice to him. And here we have the advice that Pitt would probably have got it from. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in. Now, they're receiving power. Uh, the, the Greek word means ability, uh, strength. Uh, a quality that they didn't have before. They will receive power. Now, their lives are changed. How do you know if you're a Christian? How do you know if you've got the right balance? If your focus is, is right? If your eye, so to speak, is single? How do you know that you have got that one thing 
that is good. Well, your life is changed. Here they have received power from the Holy Spirit. Now, when we were looking at the, the section uh, this morning in Acts chapter 5, and they're told that they shouldn't speak, Peter answers and says, we are his witnesses, this is verse 32 of chapter 5, we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. You see the, the link there, the Holy Spirit is given to those who have turned and trusted and they now have a changed life. They now have an ability that they didn't have before. They now can, can fight against sin. Before, sin was, was just a word, a three-letter word that really didn't affect their life. Transgressions, iniquity, all those were, were just concepts. But, but now, now they find inside them a, another desire, a desire to please God and to serve God, a desire to follow after Christ. There is an hour, a battle within them because they want to live in a way that is different from the world, different from maybe their families and friends, different from possibly their, their inclinations that they once had. They have now got the Holy Spirit and they are therefore to walk according to the Spirit. They have a power. They have an ability. How do you know if, if you are a believer or not? How do you know if a plant is alive or not? You wait and you see whether there's any leaves when they're supposed to be leaves and whether there's any fruit. That's what the Lord says and it's, it's the same with us. Do we live lives as Christians? A, a Christian is not one who has a body and says they are a Christian. A Christian is somebody who is living and moving. There's a change. They, they are those who are blessed. They are poor in spirit. They are meek. They are merciful. They hunger and thirst after righteousness. They, they're peacemakers. The, the characteristics, the, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Self-control. These are characteristics that, that are growing in Christians. We have power. We are united to the Lord Jesus Christ, our head, and we are his body. Our head is in heaven. Now, if, if you think that the, the world is a place of wickedness, and the devil is there, and sin is there, and there's problems and major difficulties, it's sort of like a, a, a river or a stream. Or a sea, a sea of unrighteousness. And we are caught up in this sea and we're trying to get free. And constantly the sea is going this way and that way and there are huge waves. And we're wondering, are we going to die? Are we going to drown? How do you know if a person is going to drown or not? Well, their head is under the water. Our head is in heaven. Our head is safe. And we, the body, are safe, therefore, because he is sat at the right hand of the Father. And so he gives to us the Holy Spirit power so that we can be different, so that we can live, so that we can fight. We will never fall. We shall never fade away like the plants and the, the flowers of the field. Why? Because we have Christ. And when we die... We go and we are with him. Because he lives, we shall live also. The, the first change that we have, if we have the right focus, if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we see him and if we've drawn close to him, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will be saved. And being saved means that God has given us the Holy Spirit. You shall have power and yes, we, we may be caught up every now and again in, in these things and those things, but generally speaking, our direction is going to be heavenward. Our life is going to be one of looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We're not those who, who love in lip only, in words but also in deeds. True religion is this, to visit the widow and fatherless 
in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. There is power. There is ability that is given. But not only that, you see the power. The power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you means that we should be witnesses. There is a change in our life. There is an ability. We can get up and we can walk and we can follow Christ. But we can think and we can speak. We can be witnesses. We can say things that we never thought we could say. We have a reason for the hope that is within us. Our lips are changed. We are now changed because we are witnesses. Because God has affected our mind. There's a, an account, uh, a theological professor of the, the 19th century uh, wrote down about his students. And it's, it's quite scary in one sense. They, they went there to become preachers. And he said that there was one young lad that came to him. And his, he had to do an essay on Martin Luther. And he, he read works and sermons by Martin Luther. And he said, oh, this Martin Luther, he doesn't seem to know what he's on about. He doesn't seem to mention Jesus anyway. And the lecturer smiled to himself. Well, two years later, in this guy's third year, he was converted. <laughs> it's, a, it's a question. It was one of these German theological courses. He was converted. And then the lecturer turned to the student and he said, go and read Luther now. And the boy came back to him and he said, Christ is everywhere. He's in all his sermons. You see, he's been given power. He's been given a clear thought. He's been given a new mind. He's been given ability. He can now witness. And here these disciples who, who had muddled thinking, who were, were uncertain about what was going right and what was going wrong. And, and remember Jesus, when he talked to them, he, he said to them, and Mark does it so well because it's, it's the section of the sermon. In, in the center of Mark, you've got that section. The first part goes on about um, who is Jesus. And then they get it. Peter says, you are the Christ. But they don't get it. And so the... The apostle puts in there, he puts in that, that account of Jesus meeting a man who couldn't see. And the man doesn't see immediately. He doesn't see immediately. He, he looks and he sees. And Jesus says, what do you see? And he says, I see men, there's trees walking. He can partly see. Partly see. And then Jesus says, look up. And he looks up. And then he could see perfectly. And then we're told in the gospel that then Jesus began to teach them and to say that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be betrayed and be crucified the third day. Now, the power, the power that, that went into that man, that changed him, that gave him sight, is the same power that went into the apostles and those that followed the Lord Jesus Christ after Pentecost and enable them to see the things of God in the scriptures. It, they opened their eyes so they could see. And when they opened their eyes, they could therefore speak. If you read the, the accounts of the, the, the preaching, the messages, they, they're so full of Christ. They're so full of Christ all the way through. They, they're not like the sermons that we get. In, in so many churches today where you might have a sermon on prayer one week and then the next sermon it'll be on giving and the next sermon will be on this and the next sermon and you're thinking where's Christ? Where's Christ? Christ is, is at the centre. Christ is, is the sun by which we see everything and here the disciples are told but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The mind is changed. The eyes are open. The lips are loosed. And they can witness. They can witness of me. Witnesses to me. It says, witnesses to me. When we witness, we're witnessing to Jesus. We're telling people about the Saviour. We're telling people about the only person that can save them. We're telling them about the living God. We are his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And God does this because he has changed us and he has given us his spirit. When the spirit comes, he will teach you 
all things. We have power. So when you get the right focus, when you become a believer, then your mind is changed and your life is changed because you have the Holy Spirit. That's the, the first thing. Now, we need to say things here. That doesn't mean that Christians don't make mistakes. That doesn't mean that Christians don't sin. Because we are still in this world and we still have difficulty. When Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he, he washed the disciples' feet, showing them that they'd been cleaned completely. God had separated them and cleansed them. But day by day, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to sin. And day by day, they're going to have to clean their feet. You see, the, the, this was a, a, a picture that you had in that time. It, it, it's what happened. In those days, they had sandals. They'd walk around in their sandals and their feet would get dirty. And then they'd go into a house to have a meal with people. And then they'd recline at tables and their feet would be out. And they'd have a servant. The, the lowest servant would be the one that had the job of washing the feet. So that they'd have clean feet when they ate the food. Why? Because they didn't wash the rest of them because they were away from the mud and the muck and the dust. But the feet would be washed. And Jesus... Jesus washes their feet. And Peter says, well, wash the rest of them. He says, no, 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 no. It's your feet. That's why, we're, that's why we are being saved. We, we have been saved. And we are being kept. We're being kept to that day. He is still our saviour. He isn't our saviour when we're converted. You know, in 1973 or whatever it was, I was converted on that day. And now Jesus is my saviour. I've, I've ticked that box. I've sorted that out. No, he's still my saviour. He keeps me. He holds me. He's forever with me. The Lord is at my right hand. He is my shade. The sun shall not strike me by day, nor the moon by night. They shall never perish. Neither there shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. The Lord Jesus Christ is forever our saviour. But we still sin. We still need that lamb in the morning and that lamb in the evening. To take away our sin. And so in the morning we, we wake up and we commend our day to the Lord. And we confess our sins. And we ask for help. And, and at the end of the night, the evening time, we then reflect on what's happened. And again we go back to our Saviour. And we thank him and bless him. And ask him for mercy and forgiveness for keeping and being able to keep going. The, the, first, the first change, if we've got the right focus, is that we have ability and power. We, we are different people. We are now in Christ Jesus. And we and our lives are changed. S secondly then, we are his witnesses. You witnesses to me. You know, when we, when we go out, well, when my school goes out on a trip, we, we're constantly saying to the children before they go, now remember, you're wearing school uniform, you're representing the school. Don't let us down. Generally speaking, they don't. They're really good. I've got to say that just in case this is recorded and I might get sacked if I say anything else. It's a wonderful school. It's a wonderful school. The children don't let us down. They're wearing the uniform. You know, imagine they go around and they do something really untoward. They say, oh, it's that school. I recognise the uniform. We are witnesses of Christ. We are Christians. It doesn't take long for people to realise that we are believers. What did you do on the weekend? You're going to say, well, I went to church. Oh, that's unusual in this day and age. How long have you been going there? And then you might say, well, I've been going there since I was converted. I was converted. And then you might have a, a short opportunity to, to explain how God saved you. And they start thinking, oh, gosh, strange one. Christian. And then they'd be watching you. They'd be watching you. They'd be looking. Because they're part of the world. And they're watching you to find an error, to find a fault. Because the fact that you were there means that there is a God. The fact you were there shows them that Christ does save people. That the gospel is true. 
the fact that you were there shows them that there is somebody that they're going to have to give account to. And so they'll be watching you with critical eyes, waiting for you to make a mistake so they can say the words, and I thought you were a Christian. Oh, and then they have conversations with their friends. And, well, I don't think much about Christianity. Do you know what this person did? Who are we letting down? We're letting down the gospel. You are witnesses to me. You shall be witnesses to me. How, how hard is that? How difficult is that? What a burden that is upon us to go out into the world knowing that people can look at us and turn away from the gospel and despise and reject Christ because of what we've done or said. But this is the amazing thing. He is our saviour and he loves us and he knows what we're like. And he remembers that we are weak and yet he still loves us. And he, he cares for us and he will use us. He will use us so that we can be his witnesses and we can do good. Now, going back to World War II, there was a Christian in Germany and he was working high up in military command. And he didn't know what to do. He didn't believe that he should be involved in any plots to assassinate Hitler because he'd been putting authority over him and he, and he was stuck and he, he didn't know what to do. He wanted the war to end and he didn't know, but he was high up and Hitler trusted him. He had probably the, the best brain for working out ciphers and plans and things in Germany at that time and Hitler constantly turned to this man. Well, when the British and the Americans were planning their their D-Day operations. They decided that they couldn't just go and land on the beaches of Normandy. They had to have diversions. So they, they tried to, to build up certain troops in Hastings and places like that, and they put General Patton there as a big American general, so everyone would thought that the, the invasions would be in the top, the northern parts of France. And then they, they had this body a man had died, a Welshman, and they, they planted uh, diplomatic papers and various plans and stuff on him, and they threw him over. So to pretend that he'd been killed, going over with, with secret messages. And the body was found with these documents, supposedly saying that there was going to be an invasion and it was going to be in the northern part of France. Well, this, this German officer, who was a Christian, was contacted by Hitler. He said, can you look at these things? My generals seem to think they're fake. What do you think? Well, he looked at them and he immediately recognised that they, they were not quite as they should be. But he knew that he could do good. And so he told Hitler that as far as he was concerned, because he was very careful in what he said, as far as he was concerned, it looked like these papers were saying there was going to be invasion in the north. So Hitler sent most of his troops up north. So they were all up north. So when the invasions came and the Normandy beaches, there wasn't that much cover for them. Now this man didn't think he could do anything to help. There was Bonhoeffer and others who, who were involved in various activities and stuff, but he couldn't do that. God gave him an opportunity and used him. There's another opportunity to encourage us of William Wilberforce. Later on in his, his career, um, he, he witnessed and he lived and he was the conscience of the House of Commons. God had, had, had used him and, and they looked at him as a barometer of morality in society. What do people think is, is right or wrong in the society? Look at Wilberforce. He's the barometer. Well, he was in a debate with, with some chap and, and some guy got up and he, he spoke and Wilberforce thought this man was absolutely way off beam. And so he got up and he just tore into him for 15 minutes and he tore him to shreds, totally decimated his debate and his argument. <laughs> the debate ended. There was no one carrying on in that question. Wilberforce had dealt with it. And then Wilberforce went out into the lobby and he was so disappointed with himself. He said, I'd lost my cool. I, I 
lost my temper. I ridiculed this guy. And then one of the opposition men came up to Wilberforce and patted him on the back and shook his hand. He said, you are a godly man. And Wilberforce said, how, how can I, did you hear what I just, yes. There could be no one but a godly man that would have such a weapon in his arsenal and never use it. God can use us. When we go out and we witness and we make a total mess of it, God can use it. God can use anything. He can use a word, a sentence, a phrase, a look. He can use anything in his chain to bring people in. He will draw his people in and he will use us. You are my witnesses. Not you were going to try. You shall be witnesses to me. Another illustration, a chap called Small, I think his name was Timothy Small, something like that. He was in America and he was converted. And he was 100 when he was converted. He was converted um, after the war of American independence. He had gone with his friends. He was a, a sprightly 96-year-old. He'd gone for his friends to, to pick up apples. And he'd got up early and he'd got there and he was sitting under the apple tree waiting for his friends to arrive. And he sat there and he, he thought about his life. And he thought about when he was a little boy in Dartmouth in England. And he remembered his pastor there, John Flavel. And he remembered the pastor at the end of the sermon. Stopping. Waiting to pronounce the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. And he stopped. And he said, I don't know how I can pronounce this benediction upon you because there are so many of you here who are hard-hearted and are running into hell and turning their backs on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man, this 90-year-old man, remembered those words and he was struck. And when his friends came up, he was converted. And they said, what on earth's happened to you? He said, I've been converted by the words of John Flavel. You are my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. When we go out, the Lord will use us. We, we may make mistakes. We will make mistakes. But the Lord will use us. Because he is God. And he has chosen us. And in these earthen vessels is the Holy Spirit. And he has changed us, and he loves us, and he has decided to use us as his servants. No, as his people, we are the children of the king, and we are his witnesses. So, secondly, the change is that we will be witnesses, and we will achieve that which God has ordained. The word of God will not go out of our lips void. It will achieve what it should do. We may not see conversions that minute, but we will find out. It is everlasting life, and we will be meeting people. We'll be meeting people, we'll be talking to them, and we'll be saying to them, oh, how are you, who are you? And they'll say who they are. And they say, oh, you're Isaiah. Oh, I was so encouraged by reading your book. And he said, oh, I don't know, I was so discouraged when I wrote it. Because God said that I was going to close up minds. Oh, but your book was so wonderful to me. It was so beautiful to me. And we'd be having these conversations. And they'd be coming up to you. And they say, oh, you're so and so. I say, yes. And goes, oh, you were a great help to me. I heard you preach. I, 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 I saw you. And you spoke to a friend. And I was overhearing it. And I heard what you said. And you got me thinking. These conversations will happen. Because we are God's witnesses. He has placed us. We are the ones that take out the gospel. And we're going to take it out all over the place. We are his constant witnesses. We're not to change our thoughts. We're not to change the gospel and, and give a, a, a certain message to one person and another message to another person. If everyone is suffering from the same illness, then everyone should be getting the same remedy. It's the same Christ. There is one message. There is one Christ. There is one Lord, one faith, one repentance that take us there. 
Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, the witnesses we're to be constant. And where, where are we to be constant? Well, look what it says here. You witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There are one, two, three, four places, it seems. So why is he saying that? Well, Jerusalem, that's where they are. Remember Wilberforce? What did he want to do? He didn't want to be where he was. He wanted to go somewhere else. Pitt said, no, stay where you are. He then spoke to John Newton. And John Newton, the, the preacher, poet, said, stay where you are. Here is Jesus, and he's saying to them, in Jerusalem, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. The apostles were to be in Jerusalem. They were to stay where they were. It wasn't a nice place, Jerusalem. Forty days earlier, they'd taken the Lord Jesus Christ. And with a fake trial, they'd tortured him and crucified him. The Lord of glory, he who knew no sin. Their master. These people, they were to speak to. They were to witness to these people in Jerusalem, in a hot spot, in a difficult situation. They were to be there. God calls us sometimes to difficult situations. And he expects us to witness there. Jerusalem was their home. He says, I want you to stay home. I want you to tell your family. I want you to tell your friends. You, you know, I, I find it so wonderful when I, I read in, in 1 Corinthians when Paul goes through the list of the people that have heard Jesus. And he says, and he appeared to his brother. I find that so wonderful. There he is. Brothers, half brothers, and sisters, and he appears to his brother. He doesn't leave his family out. He appears separately to him, head of the family, John. So he will know that, yes, I was the Messiah. I am the Messiah, and I have risen again. Look, I am your Lord and your God. At home, we're to witness at home. Sometimes it's easier to witness to friends or to families or strangers or to get up into a pulpit and speak to people because it's not at home. They know what you like at home. They've seen you at home. And here Jesus says, I want you to go home. I want you to stay at home. There's the demoniac who is being chained and who is wicked and evil and, and he's been converted completely. And he says, Jesus, I want to come with you. And Jesus said, no, go back home and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. And he went back and he said what Jesus had done for him. There's Esther. And his difficulty in her. He's told by Mordecai, maybe God has raised you up for this reason. That's why you're in this place. Jesus says we are our witnesses at home in difficult places. That's where we are. God has placed us in homes. He's given us families. And we're to be witnesses there. Homes. Families. Judea. All Judea. What's Judea? Well, that was a, a religious group, but they were the other group. There was Jerusalem, and then there was the outside bits. But they'd come in. We're to, to be with them as well, our outside family. Those who are our family and those who are our friends, those who are not living with us immediately. We're, we're to witness to them as well. We're to pray for them. We're to think about them. We're to take opportunities at, at Christmas and Easter that God has given us. What wonderful opportunities to, to maybe say something or, or give them a, a little Christian something. Pray and, and take opportunities to Judea and Samaria. Who are the Samaritans? <laughs> we don't talk to the Samaritans. I'm from Swansea. So we don't talk to people from Cardiff. So what has God done? He's given me a wife from Cardiff. Where do I live? Cardiff. There's no one. There is no one that we're to say is our enemy and we do not give the gospel and we don't pray and we don't witness for them. How Are they not our, our brothers, our sisters? Are they not human beings like us? Have they not got a soul? 
Are they not made in God's image? Should we not witness to them also? There is no one we should turn away from. God cares for all sorts of people. Every situation, every place, every culture, every country, every age. There are people that God is calling and we, we are to go and we are to, to speak and we are to be his witnesses even to Samaria and to the end of the earth. You know, they took time getting out of Jerusalem and God closed the door in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed and you had the great dispersion and all the Jews were sent out. And the apostles and Christianity went out. Sort of like, you know, in, in, in the summertime when you, you get these little things that fly in the sky and they, they drop down and then plants grow up. It's the wind that takes them. Here we have the dispersion and the gospel is, is spread to Pontus and Bithynia and Galatia to Britain, it spread to the ends of the earth. All creatures that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. The witness that people have, the heart that we are given when we have the right point, the right view, is that we start caring for people we've never heard about and we probably will never meet. We start praying for them. We start getting interested in the news and the international situation. And immediately we think of people who are there that are our family, Christians. I wonder how Christians are coping in this situation and how they're getting on. And then we, we involuntarily start praying for them. It's a quick prayer that goes up. We don't realise, but we've done it. It's as natural as us breathing. We will be praying for these people. And then our thoughts will be, I wonder if God is changing people's minds through this. You know, there's um, R.C. Sproul was a, a preacher in America who died a, a few years ago. And he talks about his conversion and, and what happened. And, and he said that he found it very interesting when he, he read that John Piper had been converted and he was converted because of the uh, Watergate scandal. It shook him when he realised what, what people were like in high places. And the Watergate scandal was, was an uh, event that affected John Piper. They, there are things that happen in this world, big things, that affect people. And, and we're going to find out when we get to heaven what big things have happened. Oh, there was a war here. Oh, there's a rule. And it scared people and it made them worried. There was a storm coming and the storm came and, and it was going to destroy the house or so they thought. And they were worried and so what did they do? They turned to their husband. They said, I'm scared of this storm. What should you do? And they seek counsel. And then they start being troubled and they start wondering about their future and their eternity and where they're going to be. And God uses these things and converts them. The ends of the earth. We're concerned about the ends of the earth. You know, you, you look and you look and you look. And you can't see. You can't see anything. The ends of the earth. The uttermost parts. They are interesting to us. It's the same message. And what is, what is that message? Well, there was a, a really rich man and he had a poor girl helping him, a maid called Jane. And she was a Christian. And Jane was going to church on Sunday. She managed to get him to allow her to go to work in the morning, very early, so she could go to the services in the afternoon. They had one service. They were an Anglican church. It's the 19th century. So she used to go there. And then she'd come back and the, the man would say, oh, have you learned lots of things today then? Are you a much better person? He'd, he'd, he'd really make fun of her. But she didn't mind. She smiled. And this went on for years. And, and then he got very ill. And he was in his bed and he, he called for Jane. He said, Jane, Jane. What must I do? What have I got to do to become a Christian? He'd seen her. She'd been witnessing in that house in Jerusalem. It was difficult. What must I do? And she said, well, you've, you've got to go, you know the stable? 
you're going to go into the stable and you know the, the, the hay in the corner, you're going to kneel and he said, get out. Get out. A few days later, he called her. He said, Jane, I'm ready to go to the stable to kneel in the hay. She said, oh, master, you don't need to kneel in the hay. You just need to humble yourself before God and ask him to save you. That's the message. That's all. That's all. It takes God to do it for us. But that's the message that we come for. The Lord Jesus Christ has come to seek and to save those who are lost. He's come for sinners, not for righteous people. And we, we are to say, sinners, come to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God because he comes and he cares for you. Say to him like that, that poor man that went to church and couldn't lift his head and beat his chest, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. A sacrifice has been made. The lamb has been slain before the foundation of the world, and whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. How do we know whether we have the, the main point? Well, our lips are changed, our mind is changed, our lives are changed. And we are witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and for the uttermost parts of the earth. We long for people to join us and to be saved so that we together will all be able to sing his praises. What a glorious saviour.